All right, so God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, according to Hebrews 13, 8. Um, if you'll turn with me to page 84 in None Like Him, I'm going to read a small section that I think really stood out to me and I think summed up his immutability pretty well. Yeah, 84. So in that second paragraph down where it starts, the scriptures speak of a God who does not change. Like the tallest mountain peak on the horizon, from generation to generation, God stands unchanging, immutable, anchoring the landscape of human existence as all else around him ebbs and flows, blossoms and withers, waxes and wanes. The rock of our salvation endures. The sunshine and shadows of human circumstance may reveal certain contours of his character one day and different ones the next, but his character remains fixed. His plans remain steady. His promises remain firm. In an ever-changing world, he is the unchanging reference point upon which the inner eye fixes to determine the direction that leads to home. So I wanted to break, break that down a little bit because there are three aspects that God doesn't change. First, God's character doesn't change. He says, I am who I am. He calls himself that. Um, God is God's infinite and, internal, and eternal nature. So infinite and eternal. We've already studied those concepts. His infinite and, and eternal nature applies to all his attributes. He is infinitely and always good. He is just, merciful, kind, loving, and generous. All of his attributes, he uh, does not change in those. Um, this applies to all parts of the Trinity as well, infinitely and internally. So there's not just one part of the Trinity that's more good or more just or one that's more loving than, the, than another part of the, the Trinity. They are all infinitely and eternally good, long-suffering, wise, um, and they do not change in these characteristics um, from infinity to infinity. <laughs> so uh, also, number two, uh, God's plan or purpose does not change. So can I have us read a couple of verses in this area? Uh, can someone turn to Isaiah 14, 24? Raise your hand if you got it. Or you're going to get there. And then can someone go to Isaiah 46, 9 through 11? Who's going to turn there and read? Sarah? <laughs> Who's got Isaiah 14, 24? Have you have it? And then hold on one second. Job 42, 2. Rebecca Vance, do you want to read Job 42, 2? I know you like to turn pages. <laughs> um, so Rebecca's got to anyone want to take Hebrews 6 17 who wants to read Hebrews 6 17 Vicki and can someone read numbers 23 19 Bobby okay Let's start with Isaiah 14, 24. The Lord of the heavens armies has sworn this oath. It will all happen as I have planned. It will be as I have decided. Okay. And Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. Okay, thank you. Uh, Job 42, 2. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Thank you. And Hebrews 6, 17. 
because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath. Okay. And wait, that was Hebrews. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Okay, so I think all those verses, why, <laughs> why we read those kind of... Um, emphasize that God's plans or purpose do, does not change. And that is something he says to be true of himself. And I think we've already established we can trust him in what he says to be true of himself. And uh, we know that he does not change. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I wanted to raise kind of a tough question about God's plans or purposes not changing because, you know, you might have been reading through the Old Testament or even the New Testament and you think, wait a second, you know, sometimes it seems like God's plan changes based on things that happen. Like in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, God is going, he says he's going to destroy Nineveh, but then he doesn't when they repented. Does this mean God changed his mind? And so when you read stories like that, you think, well, God doesn't change, but it seems like he changes what he's going to do next, or it changes what he's going to do. So, this is where we must read the Bible carefully. Uh, we must look at what God says regarding his plans and purposes, and we must look at them in the surrounding con context to see if this is God, if God's stated plan is an unconditional divine proclamation. So God saying, I am never going to flood the world again, or the wages of sin is death. These are divine proclamations. They do not change. Or if this is a conditional divine announcement. So a conditional divine announcement is something like a warning that the prophets would give Israel, like, hey, change what you're doing, or the penalty for this is going to be God taking his blessing from you, taking his presence from the temple. So, um, so yeah, those are warnings. And so I'm going to read a section of Jeremiah. Turn with me to Jeremiah 18. Verse 5 through 12. Yes. Then the word of the Lord came to me. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it, and if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it, and if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will relent of the good that I intended to do to it. I think that that's as far as I want to read. Um, yeah, that's good enough. <laughs> um, so reading that verse, which is that? Is that a divine proclamation that God is unconditionally issuing to Nineveh? Or is that a conditional divine announcement or warning? warning? Warning, yes, exactly. There's conditions. If they repent, God is going to spare them. If they are blessed and then they turn to evil ways, then God is going to remove his blessing from them. So, um, so yes, this is not God changing his mind. And these are sometimes... The reason I bring this up, and I think this is kind of a tough question, but should have an easy answer, but these are the kind of objections, the kind of supposed contradictions that atheists or non-believers will, will hear about, oh, well, God, you know, he changes his mind all the time. It's like, no, that's not exactly <laughs> what's happening here. So it's good to have, you know, some context to these things. So these kind of tough questions do arise from a non-believer, you kind of know how to address them. So think about it this way. Uh, humans have free will to accept or reject God in his ways. 
Um, but we could, there's nothing we can do to surprise him. Um, there's no decision that we can make that he hasn't seen coming. Um, so, you know, there is no surprises there when Nineveh repents. God knew that was within his knowledge and we'll get more along more on into that when we next when we talk about his omniscience, which is the fact that he is all knowing. Um, but you know, what does the Bible say that we do not have because we do not ask? This is a this is a, a verse on prayer that I think is oftentimes misused. Um, so does this mean that prayer changes God's mind? Does prayer change God's mind? Um, so this verse is actually in James 4. So if you turn with me to the book of James. James chapter 4. The verse in the context here is this. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions, you adulterous people. Um, so yeah, that doesn't really sound like in that context that our prayers are changing God's, God's plan. It's not, we just have to ask as a believer and we will receive. Um, these people in the context of this passage were asking, well, they were quarreling because they were coveting and all that kind of stuff. There's definitely sin in their midst. Their desires of their heart are to add to themselves. And so this is, um, when it comes to our circumstances, um, I, th there is no knowledge that we can offer to God in prayer that he doesn't already have. So there is no manipulation of prayer when it comes to God. Um, there is no plan that we can think up that he hasn't already thought. So this verse is completely out of context. But James 5, 16 God grants the request of the righteous, but only if they are already in line with his will and his purposes, because we are commanded to go to God with our requests. But um, why do we pray? We pray, um, we make our requests to God, but the purpose of prayer is more than just to request of God. It's more to, the purpose of prayer is more than just praying our way out of our current situations. Part of what we do when we bring our request to God is we are drawing near to God. We are aligning our desires with his will. And um, above all, prayer has the power to change um, ourselves, um, to power, power to change our hearts and our perspective. Um, so it's <laughs> this is a tough question that people ask. Okay, so, you know, people will attempt to um, manipulate prayer to or they will not attempt, but they will pray as if, you know, whatever they pray for, God's going to give them if that's a Ferrari or a private jet. But we, we know that God will does not change. And so we cannot influence God's will. Um, so anyways, also breaking down the passage that we read from none like him, God's promises don't change. So God does not change, but he is this. He is not immobile. He, God does not change, but he is not immobile. And he is static. He is executing his plans. So John 1, 14 says the word became flesh. That is actually a change, but I want you to, this is a little bit of a brain teaser here, but I want you to think of it this way. All change is action, but not all action is change. So all change is action, but not all action is change. So I want that to rattle around your brain <laughs> this week a little bit. If you, if you want to really contemplate on God's plans and his, his immutability, but he is not the clockmaker God who set all things in motion and now just watches as it all unfolds. He is he is living and active. To, to fully understand his immutability, we must understand that God was and is 
actively executing his plan in ways that not that do not contradict what he has said is true about himself. So that is how his mutability kind of interplays with all of this stuff. So what what he has said he is, he will always be, and what he has promised he would do, he will always do. And we can forever trust him to act in harmony with who he has revealed himself to be. So, okay. I feel like I was going really fast there, but that's a lot. Any questions on that topic before we move on to omnipresent? Okay. All right. So omnipresent, the God of infinite place. God is everywhere and fully present everywhere all the time. <laughs> so that's a, that's a whole mouthful to wrap your brain around. He is everywhere and fully present everywhere all the time. So the, the thing with that is we're just not necessarily aware of him that he is everywhere all the time. So I thought this was an interesting section to read because um, someone actually uh, sent me a text message this week and said, is God really present in hell? And I was like, that's an interesting thing. And I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, that's not something I had ever really thought about until she wrote that in there. And I was like, okay, well, let's go to scripture and see what scripture says. And thankfully, Jen provided us the scripture that <laughs> um, supports her position that God is present in hell. So um, that was Psalm 139. Um, if you guys did that in the um, verses for reflection. Um, so I'll turn there. just a quick little section of Psalm 139 where it talks about this. But... Um, so yes, God is present in hell. And I immediately, you know, I was like, that is not, that is not the most comfortable truth in the Bible. I don't know if I like to think of the holy, wonderful God <laughs> present in hell, um, but it's true. And reason um, stands to say that if God has no limits, then there is no limit to where he can be. If we put, say he is not somewhere, that is a limit on him. And we know he is limitless. Um, he is infinite. Um, and he is infinite in regards to his place. Um, so there is no place where God is not. But what about when God removes his glory from the temple? Are there places that God chooses not to go? Um, and I think that is a misinformed question there because here's what we have to understand and that is there's a difference between God's omnipresence and his manifest presence. So God's manifest presence is when God reveals or uncovers or lays bare something of himself so that he can be seen or felt by man. So these are times when God's presence someplace is openly evident and it's undeniable. So some examples of manifest, manifest presence. Anyone have an example of manifest presence of God? Burning bush. Yes, burning bush. What else? And a time when God appeared either in sight or sound, um, in person to someone in the Bible. Yep. Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any theophanies. So anytime that um, Jesus appeared uh, in the Old Testament, those are examples of his manifest presence on it in the Old Testament. So yeah, I, I think theophanies are really cool. That's um, something I haven't really studied until, you know, a couple years ago in studying um, it was our last Bible study, but um, but yeah. So theophanies, um, anything in the New Testament. Let me put you to the Book of Acts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pentecost. yeah, Pentecost. Exactly. Yes, the Pentecost um, in uh, the Old Testament. God actually dwelling in the temple in Jerusalem. That is the manifest presence of God. So when God removes His 
his glory from the temple. That is him removing his manifest presence from, uh, from a, a place. So um, when we ask God to be present in our church services, um, this is what we are asking for, his manifest presence. We know he is present here. He is in our midst. But when we ask God to show up, what we're asking for is we are asking for him to show up in an undeniable way because what happens when he shows up? So we've talked about the burning bush. We talked about Pentecost. We talked, oh, I forgot the most important one. Jesus is on earth. He's the manifest presence of God. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, we missed the most important one. So, so what happens when Jesus shows up? What happens when the bush starts burning, when there's a pillar of fire guiding the, the Hebrews out of Egypt? You know, what happens when God's manifest presence shows up, this is a question for you all, not rhetorical. <laughs> but I do have the answer. Yes. That, like, the road to a man. Yes. Comforting. Yeah, like a reassurance. A reassurance, yes. Um, I think one of the most important things that happens when God's manifest presence shows up is me, we are made aware of the the glory of God and the glory of God should truly humble us and should bring about repentance. So we see when Jesus appears to um, Saul, um, he that's repentance. Uh, I think, yeah. So often throughout the Bible, when you see um, glory and God revealed to man, they're, they just are, they, they fall to their knees. They groan with with just without words, um, just and and repent. Woe is me! I'm I'm a man of unclean lips. Like I, you know, it, it brings repentance. Um, we know that when Moses physically looked or got a glimpse of God, he was actually physically changed. There was something that was visibly altered about his appearance. We don't specifically know from scripture, but we know that something physically altered him. Um, so there is there's an undeniability about God's power to change us when when we come into his manifest presence. And I think another one is is healing. Jesus on earth, like he, he that was one of the the miracles that that he did. And and, and I think, you know, when manif God's manifest presence is shown, there there's just miracles are done. Um, so this isn't something that's just reserved for the Old Testament. We are, we are praying for God to show up in our church services, showing God to show up when we get together and pray together. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys this, have any of you ever been in what you believe is the manifest presence of God? While you all think, I'll, I'll give you an example where, I felt that I was in the undeniable presence of the Holy Spirit. Um, Sam and I, we were traveling to his parents and we were there over the weekend. Um, it was a few years ago before, um, before he was actually the pastor of this church and it was a very busy, very trying time in our lives. And so as I believe he was an elder at the time. So of course, you know, <laughs> The it, church on a Sunday when you are in leadership, I was probably at the time employed at the church. It's can, you can very much get down into the nitty gritty busyness of church service. But we went to church at his parents' church, and he and I, when we left, we were like, "What? What was that?" We were just absolutely floored because the worship in this church service, we, I don't know if his parents, oh, I don't think we asked his parents about it, but. We don't know if anybody else felt this way, but we were just absolutely overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit in this service. Nothing happened other than you could just feel the joy of the Spirit in the worship and the, 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 the Holy Spirit in turn worshiping itself, worshiping God. And we could just feel the delight of the Spirit in the worship. And in turn, it strengthened and bolstered us in a time that we, when we were tired. So like, like Sue said, you know, it was, you know, such a interesting way that God ministered to us, but we were just absolutely floored and just, you know, it's, it was just a feeling that we were like, oh, I would know that feeling again if I walked into a worship service and felt the spirit like that. Um, so I don't know if you guys have felt that in a worship service where you're just like, man, I just feel it. I just feel the spirit ministering to me, ministering to something in you. But yes. Um, so yeah, 
I don't know. Um, take with that what you will. Does anyone have a, a, a story kind of like that? Or does that kind of inspire you? It's okay if you don't. Um, because, um, sorry, I don't want to cut anybody off before I go into my next thought, <laughs> if anybody's forming a thought. Anyways. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I don't want to cut anybody off <laughs> forming a forming something, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, th th there's no shame in not having an experience like that, um, because, you know, I, I think there are some churches that, uh, that abuse this, so I don't want us to mistake the lack of God's manifest presence as the absence of his blessing, or that he isn't pleased with our worship, um, because these are very inspiring, special important times, but, you know, don't mistake a whole lot of tongues or holy laughter or sore elbows getting healed as God's, God's anointing of, of, of a worship service. Like that, that is an abuse, <laughs> abuse as well. Um, so, you know, all that chaotic nonsense, that, that's not a sign of God's blessing. That's not a sign of God's manifest presence there. Um, but just because there are some churches who lean towards this absurdity doesn't mean that we should throw the baby out of the bathwater. Um, it's okay to desire to be in the undeniable presence of God this side of heaven. Um, we are to have faith and wait patiently to see fully what God has promised um, and revealed to us. Um, but God is willing to give us a taste of what is waiting for us in heaven of that presence face to face with him. Because, you know, uh, this is something that we naturally desire in our relationship with, with God. So I think it's okay to say, you know, God, um, reveal your glory to me. Reveal your power to me. I think that's something, you know, that, that, that's okay for us to ask. I mean, um, we should, by all means, not obsess over it. We can ask him to be here, but we can't do anything to force him to show up. Um, that is for him to do at his will, um, in accordance with his plans. Um, so, you know, yes, I think it's a holdover from the garden. When we were created, we were created to be in the presence of God. And so I think that echoes today um, has this kind of lo deep longing to return to that, to, to be um, in heaven with our Lord. Um, but yes, so yes, don't <laughs> don't over it. Um, it is a wonderful blessing, and you know if it happens, it happens. But yeah, don't hold. Attempt to hold your faith hostage and attempt to manipulate God. Like if you don't show up today at this service in this way, I'm gonna never come back. That's you can't manipulate God. It's only going to, um, yeah, that's not going to go well. Um, so yeah, don't put your own sanders on it. But anyway, so that's the difference between God's uh, omnipresence and his manifest presence. So hopefully that gives some clarity to some of those verses where, you know, it says God left this place and things like that. So 